Did you know that you can find the word Hamas in the Bible? Yeah. And it's spelled exactly like the Hamas today. This is a real thing, my friend. I'm going to show you right now. I'm going to show you where you can find it in the Bible, and it's not in a good context at all. In fact, it was about how just before why God destroyed the world in the great flood. And guess what? Jesus references that as pertaining to his return, like what to look for, what it will be like just before his return. I'm going to show you right now. Let's get into the scripture. Here here it is. Check this out. Genesis chapter 6, it says right here, Then God said to Noah, The end of humanity has come before me. For the earth is filled with violence. For the earth is filled with Hamas. Hamas, right? If you want to say it in Hebrew. Hamas? What are you talking about? Well, that's what the word is for violence. The original Hebrew scripture had this word right here for the reason that God destroyed the world. But what did he do in his grace? He spared who? Noah and his seven family members, right? Which speaks to me of Jesus, Noah being a type of Jesus, and seven, right? There's seven churches in the book of Revelation, his seven family members going with him and being saved. Whoa. (laughs) All right, let's continue, guys. Let's look at this. So that word Right here, this is the Hebrew. You could read it. It's from right to left. Remember that? But the Hebrew right here is that word in Genesis chapter 6, Hamas. Hamas, right? So how did this happen? Why why did God do this? Well, let's look at it. So it means with violence, Hamas. Here's the Hebrew right here, and it means with violence. So never again, my friend. Never again. What's happening right now in Israel, this this war that's going on in Israel, God said that he's going to save all of Israel. They will not be exterminated. I know a lot of the people in the world want Israel as a nation to be exterminated, to be wiped off the map. God is not going to allow that. Not for one second. He will not allow that. He loves Israel. Jesus, Yeshua, right, loves Israel. The Father loves Israel. Israel is the apple of the Father's eye. The Holy Spirit loves Israel. And there's a great plan. And it's spelled out in many stories in the Old Testament, like Joseph. And you could look at that playlist right here, my friend, how to find Jesus in the Old Testament and see how Joseph is a type and a picture, a foretelling of Jesus and God's plan. It's amazing. Moses as well. You see it all where they they had Gentile brides and then they're called back to do what? To save Israel. Joseph saved all of Israel. Moses saved all of Israel. Before that, they had a Gentile bride with them before the time of trouble. So right now, Israel's at war with Hamas. Hamas is evil. God is not happy with Hamas. He wants to save many of those Palestinian people or maybe some Hamas guys that repent. But they're still going to have to suffer the consequences of what they did that was evil. The people in the flood had to suffer the consequences of what they did. Now, perhaps God saved some of their souls if they repented, but we don't know that for sure. But, you know, that, that's their only hope. So why did God destroy the earth the first time? Because of Hamas, because of the violence over all the face of the earth, which is kind of like today. It's not just in Israel and the Middle East and in Gaza. We're seeing these protests all over New York City, Paris, London. It's all over the world now, this Hamas, right? This violence. You know, Antifa and Hamas kind of being like one and the same. It's weird. They even wear the same colors. Isn't that strange? So never again. God's not going to allow it. He won't let that happen. Israel's not going to let that happen. They're going to, that's their their uh, motto, never again. It won't happen, you guys. That's why they have their own country, because they've been persecuted throughout the centuries. So let's get back into the presentation. So never again is that going to happen. Israel will not allow it. God will not allow it. 
Matthew 24, Jesus said, what will be the, or excuse me, the disciples said to Jesus as they were sitting on the Mount of Olives looking over at, across uh, the valley, right? The Kidron Valley, looking at the temple. And they asked Jesus, they say, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? End of the age? Well, yeah, the church age, right? That's what we're in right now. The end of this age of grace, where you could be saved and spared from God's wrath. You wouldn't have to go through this time of wrath that's coming upon the whole world. Just like in Joseph's story with the famine, Moses' story with the plague, same thing, guys. So, Jesus said, but about that day and hour, no one knows. No one knows the day or the hour. Don't ever let anybody date set on you. You know they're wrong right away because it goes right against what Jesus said. So of that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. Now, what does that speak of, guys? Now, think about it. The Jewish culture, the Jewish wedding of that time was that a couple would become betrothed. Well, the Son would meet with the the bride's uh, father, and they would have the cup, right, and the bread together. They would have the the wine and the bread together, what does that speak of the communion, right? And then they would be betrothed, which is the same as being married, but they didn't get together yet. And then the son would go back to his father's house and he would build a room attached to the father's house and prepare this place for his bride. And he would keep working at it and preparing it and making it more and more beautiful. This is the Jewish culture of the time. So when Jesus is referencing the bride, right? The brides and the virgins, all that stuff was all referencing the Jewish wedding. So check this out. One day, the the son didn't know when it was going to be, but he just kept preparing that place. And one day, the father would say, okay, it's finished. Go get your bride. It was a surprise, right? The son didn't know that day, and he would go back. He would go back to that village where his bride was, and he would announce it. Him and his his friends of the bridegroom would announce it, sometimes with a trumpet, right? The trumpet would sound, and he would sh- they would shout out, the groom is here, the bride's groom is here. And the, the bride would, uh, who was betrothed to him would get her oil lamp ready, and it was filled with oil and ready, and she would light it, and she would go out to meet him, and off they would go to that place that he had prepared at the Father's house, right? Remember Jesus said, I prepared a place for you. And they would go there for seven days. Like it was a seven-day honeymoon, just them two together, which speaks of, to me, like the seven, right? Seven years, like the weeks in Daniel, that last week that we're still waiting for, the seven days year tribulation period where we're caught up right at the beginning of that maybe caught up to be with who jesus to be with him in that place he prepared and then we come back and there's this feast and that's how the jewish wedding was there was this great feast after that seven days where the whole family would get together and have this banquet (laughs) this is right out of the bible right out of god's plan right and then after that what happened then the two would go to their own place, and they would start sometimes in a different town, and they would start their home there together. Well, that would speak of the thousand-year reign of Christ, where he comes back to this earth and rules and reigns with his bride from Jerusalem, forget this, 1,000 years, said six times in seven verses in Revelation 20. That's not figurative. That's literal, my friend. So, all right, let's get back into the presentation. So Jesus said about that day and hour, no one knows but the Father alone. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like what? The days of Noah. (laughs) The days of Noah, my friend. What is that like? violence all over the place, just kind of like today, right? I'm not saying that Jesus is coming today or this year or whatever, but it's interesting that that's what the world looks like, and it's headed that way more and more. For the earth was filled with Hamas, and that's what we're seeing today, and all those protests all over the world as I speak, as this war is happening in Israel against the evil, satanic Hamas. 
For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, even though there's all that violence, just like today, people are eating and drinking and what else? Marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, right? Just like when Jesus enters with his bride into that place that he had prepared, just like Noah prepared that place, and the door was shut. And what was happening? Destruction. God's wrath poured out, literally poured out, on the whole face of the earth. This is what Jesus was talking about, my friend. So Matthew 24, and they did not know, they did not understand, until the flood came and took them all away. So they were mocking Noah, actually, just like they mock Jesus today, right? And those who preach the good news, they mock us today. And that's what Peter said. They were mocking Joseph as he preached to them for a hundred years, or over a hundred years. And then that day came where the ark, the door of the ark was shut. They might be knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door, but it's not going to open for them. And they're going to have to go through this time of great trouble on the earth. They could still be saved. God has, gives everyone a second chance. This is God's nature, right? He gives them a second chance, but they'll have to lose their lives in that great tribulation period, that seven-year period. So Matthew 24 continues, And at that time, Jesus said, there will be two men in a field. Right? So he's speaking about two men working in a field just like we would today. Like I work out in the field, right? And uh, I work outside in, in, in a water department. I repair water mains and things like that. So there's two men working here on a, like a farm type work. And then guess what? One will be taken, Jesus said, and one will be left. I believe this speaks of the rapture. Some people have started to say like, no, that's not the rapture. That means something else. Uh, get over your intellectual high horse, okay? This is very simple. One will be taken, one will be left. Uh, Jesus is speaking about that time, just like the, the Noah's, uh, the door of the ark being shut. So here that guy's gone. It disappears. His rake's right here. It probably would fall to the ground. I don't think it's going to be like this big thing where planes fly out of the, fall out of the sky and all that. I think God can do it to where... It may not be noticeable. Perhaps, who knows, maybe Christians will be in, at that time, will be all be in concentration camps. Who knows? <laughs> this is kind of where the world's going, right? We might be in re-education camps, like I've heard some of these politicians say, that we need to be uh, reprogrammed, right? Deprogrammed, right? And perhaps they get all the Christians in, in all these camps, and then boom, we're gone. Who knows? We'll see. We'll see what happens. But I think persecution is definitely coming for us. That's what it seems like anyway. All right. Then we look in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now, these are the rapture verses. If you're looking for them, go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting in verse 16 here. It says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout right? Doesn't that remind you? Remember, we talked about the bridegroom coming back for his bride, and there was a great shout in the street for his his uh, betrothed bride to come out and meet him. And here it is. It continues with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, right? The trumpet of God speaks of that rapture. That's in Revelation, right? Where we see there's this church the letters to the church, which could speak of church phases in history, and then suddenly there's this trumpet that that uh, John sees, and then the and a shout, and that door opens to heaven, and he goes up. I believe that that's a picture of the rapture of the church. And the dead, that just means caught up, by the way. Rapture just means caught up to be with the Lord, just like Enoch walked away with the Lord. And the dead in Christ will rise first. So all your loved ones that are in the grave, their bodies will meet their souls because your soul is with Jesus if you're a believer. To be absent with the body is to be present with, with the Lord. That's what the Bible says. So their souls will be united with their new bodies, like their old body transforms into this new body, just like Jesus' new body, where he can walk through walls, he can still eat and drink. It's a physical body, you guys. And it says that they will be, uh, those who were died before us will be caught up first, then here it says in verse 17, then we who are alive, who remain, right? Remain here on this earth, who are alive when that happens, will be caught up. Will be caught up. That speaks of the rapture. That's just Latin for caught up. 
rapture. And so it's harpazo in the Greek, right? But in Latin, it's it's rapture. So if you have a Latin Bible, you'll find the word rapture, because some people say there's no word rapture in the Bible, and and they just don't know. They haven't done the research. So First Thessalonians chapter 4 continues, it says, First Thessalonians continues and says, and so we will always be with the Lord after that, you guys. Isn't that beautiful? We will always be with the Lord, caught up and then always be with the Lord. Sorry about that. (laughs) These little pop-ups. Isn't that annoying on computers? All right. So then we continue. Therefore, comfort one another. Don't scare one another, right? We're not, these aren't scary verses. These are comforting verses. Comfort one another with these words. What words? The word of God. These are coming from God. Now look at this. It continues. So now we're in chapter five. Remember the chapters were put in later by scholars. This is just one scroll written to the Thessalonians that Paul wrote. Chapter 5 says, the day of the Lord is coming like a thief in the night, like a surprise, right? Not after the tribulation period, then you would know exactly when he was coming, or not mid, you would also know the exact day, but no one knows the day or the hour. So Jesus comes first by surprise, like a thief in the night, to take his bride away, but then he comes later, the whole world will see it, and he'll touch down on that Mount of Olives and he'll split in two, just like Zechariah says. And then he will go in and walk through the East Gate and into the glorious temple that he will be in for a thousand years, that new temple that Ezekiel speaks about. So then it says here, while they are saying in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, while they are saying peace and safety, right? Peace and safety? then sudden destruction will come upon them. They might be thinking there's going to be this great reset. Now we got rid of those Christians. They're gone. They're vanished. Those believers in Jesus, gone, out of our world. The basket of deplorables have been taken away out of our lives. And now we could have this great reset, peace and safety. Then what happens? Sudden destruction will come upon them. That seven-year time of great trouble. Like labor pains upon a pregnant woman. So when they start, you cannot stop them, right? But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness so that the day would overtake you like a thief. You're not in darkness if you're a believer in Jesus. For you are all sons of light and the sons of day. We are not of night or of darkness. So this is the hope, you guys. Are you a son or a daughter of the day? Or are you a son or a daughter of the darkness? Of Hamas, right? Of violence and darkness and oppression. Those are all the the meanings of that word. Physical violence to others and, and evil. That's what Hamas really is. Do you want to be a son of darkness? Or do you want to be a son or a daughter of the day? of light, of Yeshua. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And you too are the light of the world, speaking of his followers. And and we will be caught up someday if he comes in our lifetime, or if we die, we'll still be in the presence of the Lord. Our souls will be. And then someday we'll be united back with our body, our new body. Wow. This is a, a free gift that God offers you. Why would you turn this down? And why would you not want to be a son or a daughter of the day of light? You can be, my friend. You could give your life to Jesus Christ right now. If you have never given your life to him, if you're not sure, you can say this prayer after me from your heart to God. You can say it to him. This is not a prayer to me or anybody else. You you just stop what you're doing right now if you would like to believe in Jesus. You would like to be sure that if he came back, you would be caught up to be with him as his bride. Or you would be caught up to be with him when you die. The angels would take you away to heaven to be in the presence of the Lord until that day. How would you like that, my friend? To be guaranteed to live, to have life and truth in your heart, to have Jesus Christ living inside of you, in your heart as your Lord and as your Savior. Would you like that? Well, then say these words after me. I'm going to pray, and you're going to repeat those words. You are praying to God right now, all right? If that speaks to you. All right, ready? Let's pray. Say them after me. Say these words after me. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner, and I am sorry for my sin. 
I turn from my sin. I choose to follow you, Jesus. I pray that you would forgive me of my sin and help me. I believe that you died on the cross. I believe you shed your blood for me. I also believe that in three days you were raised from the dead and you are alive today. I choose to follow you as my Lord and as my Savior from this day forward. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, my friend, amen. God in heaven rejoices over one who repents. Repenting means turning back to God, turning to God, away from your evil ways and turning to him. It doesn't mean you won't mess up once in a while and sin as a believer, but it means that you are now a child of God. He lives in your heart now. So I pray the Holy Spirit fill you right now, give you peace, and make sure you get fellowship with other believers. You're going to a Bible-believing church, and you're praying every day. You're getting fellowship with other believers. If you're in Israel, go to One for Israel or go to Jews for Jesus, both great ministries that will help you, my friend. And don't forget to hit this playlist right here, How to Find Jesus in the Old Testament. You will be blessed by this. So you want to click on this playlist right now.